The modern countries of Belarus, Ukraine and Russia all claim descendants from an early medieval polity known as Rus. By 950, Rus was a nation centered around the city of Kiev, ruled by a Slavonic-speaking aristocracy. What happened before 950, and the origins of the Rus state, lay shrouded in mystery. According to the Primary Chronicle, a history of the nation written down in the 12th century, the polity was established in the year 862, when three brothers named Rurik, Sinius and Truvor were invited by the tribes around Lake Ilmen to govern over them. Rurik established himself in a fortress at Lake Ilmen and inherited his brothers' territories after they died. A few years later, the city of Kiev was conquered and made the new capital of the Rus. It is the only source we have describing the foundation of the Rus state and it has caused a lot of controversy. Since the 18th century, researchers of the topic have formed into two rivaling schools, the Normanists and the Anti-Normanists. The Normanists claim that Rurik was of Germanic, Scandinavian origin and that Norsemen, Normans, established the Rus polity. Anti-Normanists dispute Scandinavian influence, claiming that the Rus polity was an entirely Slavic phenomenon. Both sides have been highly politicized. Normanism was first established in the 18th century to legitimize the rule of the German-born Empress, Catherine II. Anti-Normanism has its roots in the same period, but became especially popular after World War II. It was sponsored by the Soviet government to push back against ideas of German supremacy and Western influence. But it doesn't mean that a proponent of either school necessarily has a strong political bias. There are Normanist Russians and Ukrainians, but also anti-Normanist Estonians, English and Frenchmen. Neither do the proponents of either school necessarily agree on everything. It's best to explain it with a sliding scale. The top being 100% Normanist, the bottom 100% anti-Normanist. At its most extreme, Normanism claims that Scandinavians established and ruled over Rus, founded cities in Eastern Europe, colonized and migrated on a large scale into Eastern European lands. On the extreme opposite, anti-Normanism claims that there was no Scandinavian influence whatsoever in Eastern Europe. Most scholars find themselves somewhere in between. The typical Normanist believes that Rurik and the ruling class of early Rus were Scandinavian, but that they intermarried and assimilated into the local culture very quickly. The typical anti-Normanist believes that the ruling class were Slavonic, but that Scandinavian merchants and warriors frequented the area. Both schools compete over several goals. The most basic are identifying Rurik and identifying the meaning of Rus. These then develop into proving or disproving the following ideas. Scandinavian colonization in Eastern Europe and Scandinavian economic, diplomatic and military involvement in Eastern Europe. Historians pull from a variety of sources to justify their claims. The oldest and most common method has been to use written sources. The problems with these are manifold. For one, they are often contradictory, fragmentary and confused. Many of them were written decades or even centuries after the event. Written Scandinavian and Slavonic sources don't appear until the 11th, 12th and 13th centuries. The ones from the 9th century or before are usually Greek or Arab and written by people who had a vague understanding of the region and its peoples. Written sources are the most unreliable. Archaeological methods were first used in the 19th century and has become progressively more influential. I consider archaeology the most reliable source, and it can often verify the ideas presented by the other methods. The newest and most advanced method is genetic research. Basically, genetic samples from exhumed corpses are compared with modern samples. The problems with genetic research is that the sample size tends to be pretty small. Most of the bodies from the period in the region were cremated, leaving only a sliver of samples. It should be viewed as a complementary resource to archaeology. Using these different sources and compiled sources by historians, this video will discuss the possible meaning of Rus, the possible identity of Rurik, and try to answer the following questions. Is there any evidence of Scandinavian colonization in Eastern Europe? Is there any evidence of Scandinavian diplomatic, commercial or military activity in Eastern Europe? Is there any evidence of Scandinavian control over Rus politics. Let's begin by diving into the meaning of the word Rus. 
and see what can be found. As a bit of a spoiler, there will be no conclusive answer to this topic, or the one about Rurik. Without a time machine, it's impossible to know the exact meaning and origin of the word ruse. Anyone who claims otherwise is talking out of their ass. It's a simple three-letter word, and could have appeared in different languages at different points in time to mean different things. By the late 10th century, historians unanimously agree that Varangian referred to Scandinavians in Eastern Europe, and Rus to the Slavonic-speaking people living within the Kievan Rus. What they disagree on is what it referred to in the previous century. Specifically, if it had the same previous meaning, if it referred to Scandinavians in the East, or both, a multi-ethnic term. Both sides quote extensively, from Arabic sources. The problem is that the Muslims had a limited understanding of the region and the peoples who lived there. Their descriptions are often confusing and contradictory. They often speak about two different groups, the Sakaliba and the Rus. Both sides tend to translate Sakaliba as Slavs, and are then able to use different quotes to support their Normanist or anti-Normanist arguments. For example, in 830, the Persian scholar Ibn Kordabe differentiated between the Rus and Sakaliba, saying that the Rus had Sakaliba servants. So it settled. Well, not so fast. Ibn Kordabe said earlier that the Arus are a tribe from among the Asakaliba. So, the Rus were a tribe of Slavs. Again, not so fast. While it's often believed that Sakaliba meant Slavs, some scholars believe that the poorly informed Arabs used it to denote any northern, fair-skinned peoples, including Slavs, Scandinavians, Balts, and Finno-Ugrians. The latter especially occupied a much larger area than they do today, areas which the Arabs interacted with as much, or even more, as traditionally Slavic lands. A text written in 932 by Ali Stakri described the Rus as consisting of three kinds, the text is quite esoteric. The associated world map looks like this and should be taken with a pinch of salt. These kinds were the ones living in Kiev with the king, then the ones living farther away called Salawiya, and finally the Arfania, whose king resides in Arfa. They were described as killing any foreigners who entered their lands, traveling down waterways to conduct trade, and sold lead and black furs. Attempts at tracking the Arfania have been unsuccessful. It could refer to Scandinavians, but also Slavs from the north like Lake Ilmen, or even the Finno-Ugrians. Normanists use several Arabic sources to explain the Rus as Scandinavian. In the 9th century, Al-Yakubi described how the city of Seville, situated on the river Cordoba in Spain, was attacked by pagans, who are called Rus. Whilst amphibic attacks in distant lands seems indicative of these Scandinavians, the excerpt is so short that little can be discerned from it. Another Arab writer, Al Masudi, made some additions on the Rus' interaction with Spain. He wrote how the Rus formed several different nations, one of which was called Ludania, and they carried out trade with Al Andalus, the Muslim country in southern Iberia. Just like Arfania, Ludania remains completely obscure. The most famous example used by Normanists comes from the Annales Bertianini, in which a Byzantine envoy arrived at the Frankish court, together with diplomats known as Ross, who had been sent by their Kaganus. After some inquiries, the Franks discovered these Ross to be from the tribe of Suiones, Swedes, who were traveling through the Frankish lands to reach their home, since the original route was deemed unsafe. The Franks believed them to be spies and decided to detain them until a report could be sent from the Byzantines. Their fate is uncertain. Again, the example is uncertain and has been interpreted in many ways. Some believe that Kaganus meant Konungur, or even Hakon, that the Swedes called themselves Rus, and had been sent to Byzantium by the king of Sweden. However, there are several sources pointing to the existence of a Rus Kagan in Eastern Europe during this period, and the title was used by the princes of Kiev well into the early Middle Ages. But the Kagan's identity is unknown. Some believe he must have been a Scandinavian Rus, others that he was a Slavic prince who simply hired Scandinavian travelers as diplomats, or even that they were hired by a Kagan from the Khazars, or even that these Ross weren't Swedes at all. The Franks just found them comparable, much how the Arabs called fair northerners Sakaliba. In 950, 
a Byzantine source called the Administrando Imperio, describes the itinerary of the Rus travelling to Constantinople. Several of the places have their names written in Greek interpretations of the Slavonic and quote-unquote Rus language. Several of these Rus words appear to be Scandinavian in origin. Notably, the Greeks wrote most of these suffixes as vorsi, which have been interpreted as the Old Norse fosh, meaning rapid or waterfall. One of the rapids was called Aifor by the Greeks, and this name, Aifur, appears on a Gotlandic runestone, seemingly referring to the same location. Then again, several of the rapids have only Slavonic names. No other mentions of a Rus language have been found, and the primary chronicle says that the Rus and Slavonic languages are the same. Lastly, when the bishop of Cremona visited Constantinople in the mid 10th century, he wrote how Rusios nos vero apposicione loci nominanus nordmanos, Rus, which we call Northmen. It has been disputed if he meant Northmen as in Scandinavians, or simply people living in the north which could also mean the Slavs if you're in Constantinople. None of these sources lead to a conclusive answer. Neither might our ideas of a national belonging be applicable to the 9th century, and in this period it was very common to use umbrella words for multiple tribes. Burgundian was used to describe several peoples, all Muslims were called Saracen, Fair Northerners called Sakaliba, and the Saxons called the Vikings Danes. Despite their forces consisting of Danes, but also Jutes, Scanians, Norwegians, Swedes, Goths, and possibly Wendish Slavs, Rus appears to have been used in a very similar manner in the 9th and 10th centuries, by Greeks and Arabs who had a poor understanding of the region, and maybe the actual meaning of the name, whatever it was. The origin of the word Rus has also been debated upon. Historians tend to pick a favorite, and then use it to support their Normanist or anti-Normanist claims of the people's origin. But the fact is that it can never be known for certain. As I said, it's a three-letter word. But here are some of the most common interpretations. The most popular theory is that Rus stems from the Finno-Ugric word Rotsi, which denotes people from Sweden. It appears in the Finnish, Estonian, Vodian, and Karelian languages. The idea is that it originally meant people from Ruthlagen, the easternmost islands and coastline of central Sweden, the inhabitants of which were called Ruthkarlar, men who row. Archaeology points to this region being among the first to having interacted with the Finns and Estonians, whose relatives were back then dominant in northern Russia. The Finno-Ugrians have traded with Persia since late antiquity and continued the eastern trade into the Viking Age. So the theory goes that the Finno-Ugrians would have used their word for Ruthkarlar Rotsi, to denote Swedes, or all Scandinavians. When they introduced their eastern trade partners to the Norsemen, the name spread, and became Rus. Then, Rus became a collective term for all fair-skinned merchants and raiders in Eastern Europe, which came to be dominated by Slavs. These Slavs then adapted Rus as their ethnic and national identity. Opponents of the theory call it linguistically possible, but otherwise far-fetched and point out how Rus, or any tribe by that name, never appear in Scandinavian sources. Another theory is that Rus is derived from the Alanic tribe of the Roxolani, who dwelled in Eastern Europe during antiquity. Rox stems from the Iranian word Ros, meaning light. The problem with this theory is that the Roxolani lived in the Far East, whereas Rus came to mean the territories around Kiev. Attempts have been made to connect the Roxolani with the Slavs, and a western migration of the name. Others have suggested that it stems from the Old Norse Rauth, meaning red. A similar word appears in the Slavic languages, Rusi, meaning people with brown hair. Its connection to the Rus state seems unlikely. There are also several rivers in central Ukraine named Ros and Rushna, and place names in the area with the prefix Ros or Rus. The name Rus may simply have been a common name in the area, According to this idea, Rus originally denoted the land of the Middle Dniepro. Antagonists of this theory could say that the state did not originate around the Middle Dniepro, but around Ladoga, as explained in the primary chronicle. There are some other written and archaeological evidence to the northern origins of the Rus state, and Kiev might only have become the capital in the mid-early 900s. The river and place names could have been given after the foundation of the state around this city. Apparently a people named Rus 
were mentioned in Greek sources, as early as the 4th century, predating Scandinavian contact by far. Opponents of this idea present the explanation of it being a mistake in the Bible. When the original Hebrew text was translated into Greek, the words Nestros being interpreted as a people, Ros. Greek patriarchs would quote this excerpt in reference to barbarian enemies, like the Huns, and so this non-existent Ros would be conflated with the northern people. As described in the introduction, the origin of Normanism lies in the primary chronicle, which described how a tribe of Varyags came from across the Varyag Sea and demanded tribute from the Shad, Slavs, Merians, Vespians, and Kriviks. But eventually, the tribes rose up against the Varyags and drove them out. However, as they began fighting among themselves, they decided to invite the Varyags to rule over them and establish law and order. Three brothers were selected. Rurik, who ruled over Novgorod, Sanius in Belauzera, and Truvor in Isborsk. Two years later, Sinius and Truvor died, leaving Rurik as the sole ruler of the Rus state. There are a few glaring issues with this story. For one, it describes how the tribes traveled across the sea to the Varyags, to the Rus. These Varyags were known as Rus, just as some are called Swedes, and others Normans, English, and Goths. Varyag was the Slavonic word for Scandinavians, as were the listed tribes, indicating that the Rus were Scandinavian. The problem is that a tribe called Rus cannot be identified in Scandinavia by any contemporary source. Neither have historians been able to identify Rurik and his two brothers. Some historians have identified Rurik as a member of the Danish royal family, Rurikur, a nephew or even brother to King Harald Clark. According to Frankish sources, he raided the northern coast of Francia. In 850, the Franks appeased Rurikur by giving him control over southern Frisia, but he was expelled in 855 and returned to Denmark. In 870, he returned to the Franks and became a loyal vassal. The theory says that Rurikur spent his exile in northern Russia, where he formed the Rus' polity. It's highly speculative. Some have even debated the Scandinavian origin of Rurik, his brothers and the Rus. The name Rurik, Rurikur in Old Norse, does not appear especially popular during the period. Neither is the root name, Roderick, of Germanic origin, but seemingly Gallo-Roman. Some have proposed that the Rus were invited from across the sea, but not from Scandinavians, but the Wends, and other seafaring people. I've seen the argument that because Russians are called Venie in Finnish languages, this is evidence of their Wendish origin. It's uh, similar to the Rotsi theory in a way. It's interesting, but the foundations are shaky, nor does it take Sinius and Truvor into account. Both of their names seem to be Norman derivatives, like Svein and Thorvardur. It also seems highly unlikely that any group of people would willingly invite previously hostile foreigners to rule over them. It seems more like propaganda written by the ruling aristocracy, which many historians believe the Chronicle to have been, a fantastical account meant to legitimize the rule of the Kievan dynasty. Indeed, it seems likely that the entire story was just made up. It appears structured on literary traditions dating back to the Old Testament, which were popular in the Middle Ages. The concept of three brothers moving away and founding a new people appears first in the Bible. According to Genesis, Noah, his three sons and their wives, were saved in order to repopulate the earth. Genesis claims that the Arabs and Israelites stem from the first brother, Shem. Egyptians, Cushites, Canaanites and Africans from Ham and Greeks from Japhet. To this day, Christians try to trace different peoples to these brothers. The primary chronicle did as well. In fact, the chronicle opens with the biblical flood and how all the northern peoples stem from Japhet. The chronicle also uses the Three Brothers legend to explain the founding of Kiev. It seems interested in drawing parallels to all of these major events. The biblical flood, the founding of Rus, and the founding of Kiev. It appears in other medieval literature, Around 970, the chronicler Vidukind wrote how the Anglo-Saxons were invited by the Britons to rule over them and established England. On Gotland, the 13th century Guta saga speaks of how the brothers Guti, Greip and Gunfjaun settled on the island and divided it between them. Whether Rurik existed or not, there definitely appears to have been a ruler with the title of Kagan Rus 
active somewhere between Ladoga and Kiev in the early 9th century. The title itself is worth discussing. It has been proposed that it meant Hakon or Konungur from Old Norse, but seems likelier that it was one of the many Turkic elements adapted by the Rus, owing to the two being neighbors, enemies and partners. Several Arabic sources went so far as calling them brothers, and the Rus as a type of Turks, which again highlights the ambiguity. Attempts have been made to discover the origins of the ruling dynasties in the area. The first prince of the Rus to be mentioned in other sources is Oleg. According to the primary chronicle, he was a relative of Rurik. Oleg appears in contemporary sources, like a treaty from 911 with Byzantium. Oleg's successor was named Igor, husband of Olga. It has been argued that all of these names are Norse in origin. Helgi, Ingvar and Helga respectively. And thus, evidence of the individual's Norman ethnicities. There are some written sources from the period which could corroborate this idea. The Schechter letter, written in Hebrew by the Genesai of Cairo, describes the Rus' attack on Constantinople in 941. In this letter, the king of Rusia is called Helgu. Helgu appears very close to the Nordic form of Oleg. Concerning Olga, some translations from Greek sources have written her name as Helga, others as Olga, so I'm not certain what the original said. In German sources she was called Helena. Then there's the genetic research, which seems like it could provide definite evidence, but this is not the case. There's considerable disagreement on genetic findings. The available material related to the Kievan dynasty, sometimes called the Rurikid dynasty, due to the possible lineage to Rurik, comes from the living descendants of Zevolod, Chleb, the son of Sviatoslav, who died in 1078 and whose corpse was exhumed, and lastly, the living descendants of Isiaslav. These brothers were the sons of Yaroslav the Wise and Princess Ingyad of Sweden. Both Chleb and Isiaslav were discovered to have a common Slavic ancestor on the paternal line, which would either indicate that the ruling dynasty was unrelated to Rurik, that Rurik was Slavic, or never existed. However, Zevolod's descendants share a common Scandinavian ancestor on the paternal line, which some have interpreted as definite evidence of Rurik's existence and Scandinavian origin. On the other hand, it's been proposed that Zevolod wasn't Yaroslav's son, but conceived in an extramarital affair between Ingyad and Olaf II of Norway when he was traveling through Rus, hence the common Scandinavian ancestor. Further studies have been conducted on Chleb's cranium. It bears primarily Slavic traits with a few Germanic, which shouldn't be surprising. Even if Chleb wasn't the descendant of Rurik or some other Varangian, his grandmother Ingyad was Swedish. The study also says that the findings aren't entirely certain. Neither is it entirely certain if Oleg actually was related to Rurik, provided Rurik existed in the first place. There seems to be a lot of conflicting information in the different chronicles and written sources. Some historians believe that there were two Igors who ruled Kiev, the first being the son of Rurik, and the second possibly being the son of Oleg. Basically, even if Rurik existed and was Scandinavian, Oleg and his descendants, including Yaroslav, Zevolod, etc., may not have had an ancestor in Rurik. The Schechted letter also mentions Helgu in 941, but Oleg seems to have died 29 years earlier. So in the end, the origins of the Rus and its founders seem uncertain. The goal of the next part of the video is to look at the following ideas. Evidence of Scandinavian colonization in Eastern Europe during the early Rus, and Scandinavian economic, diplomatic and military involvement in the same polity. Evidence of colonization can primarily be found in archaeology. Prominent findings include buildings constructed in a manner of foreign settlers, graves constructed in the settlers' fashion, findings inside of the graves, including personal items from the individual's culture, and of course, the DNA of the corpses, provided they weren't cremated, which most of the corpses in this region from this period were. There were quite a few prominent settlements in the Rus sphere of influence, but the most important ones appear to have been Aldeguborg, Ryurika Vagaradice, Gnostava, and Kiev. Thus, the video will focus on findings from these locations. Let's start out with Aldeguborg, also called Staraya Ladega, most likely the oldest settlement in the region inhabited by Scandinavians. Situated on the Volkov River south of Lake Ladega, this area was primarily inhabited by Finno-Ugrian hunter-gatherers during the late Iron Age. Scandinavian influence can be dated to the same period, judging by findings of Vendel-era tools and weaponry, indicating the presence of both men and women. 
the area was prized for its furs, the most important trade good on the route to the Arabs and Byzantines. In the previous century, Jordanes wrote in his History of the Goths how the Swedes were involved in this fur trade. Settlement appears to have increased in the late 700s. There are findings of large houses with central fireplaces, usually interpreted as Scandinavian, but there are also remnants of smaller, Slavic houses, indicating a mixed population. In the following century, the settlement expanded further with various workshops. Findings of jewelry are both Slavic and Scandinavian in origin. For example, this figure of a man with horns appears identical to findings from Öland and Denmark. There are also quite a few graves in the Aldegiboy area. The corpses have been buried in both Scandinavian and Finnic manners, and the items inside include Scandinavian, local, Slavic, and even far-flung trade goods from the Rhineland and Byzantium. Most of the bodies were cremated, but genetic research conducted on 65 samples found that the individuals from the southern part of the cemetery appear related to Scandinavians, whereas the northern part appears to contain a mixed Slavic, Finnic, and Nordic population. Moving on to Ryurika Vagaradische, believed to have been called Holymur by the Norse. Situated on Lake Ilmen, two kilometers from neighboring Novgorod, it was a defensible and fortified urban center, constructed on a small hill. There are no findings of Scandinavian structures, indicating that it was built and primarily inhabited by Slavs. To confirm this, most of the archaeological findings consist of pottery, all of which are similar to the ones used by neighboring Slavs. However, Scandinavian items from the 9th and 10th centuries are abundant. These include male and female dress accessories and ornaments, tools, weaponry, and objects related to cult and magic, originating from central Sweden. Gnostava was largely forgotten by written sources, but judging from archaeology, appears to have been incredibly important during the Viking Age. Located on the portage between the river Lavat in the north and the Dniepro in the south, the archaeological complex consists of a settlement, a hill fort, and a large cemetery. The latter is the most interesting. Scandinavian artifacts are abundant in the barrows, containing both cremations, inhumations, and chamber graves. A lot, if not most of these graves, appear to have been constructed in a traditionally Scandinavian fashion, dating back to the Vendel era. A genetic analysis revealed that no less than 25 of the burials were Scandinavian, not all of them Swedish, but also Danish. Finally, there's the city of Kiev, which became the heart of the Rus sometime in the 10th century. The city appears to be very old, with early findings dating back to the 5th century. It appears to have been the capital of a tribal union led by the Polyanian Slavs, and they seem to have had trade contacts as far as Byzantium. It has been proposed that in the 9th century, there were essentially two separate Rus, an entirely Slavic state centered around Kiev and the Middle Dniepro, and a multi-ethnic Rus Kaganate, consisting of Slavs, Finns, and Scandinavians, centered around Ladiga and Ilmen. In the 10th century, the latter would have been absorbed by the former. It would be fun if both of these entities had been called Rus, but for different reasons. But I digress. Scandinavian artifacts in Kiev date back to the 10th century, found both loosely and in barrows, indicating that Nordic craftsmen, warriors, and merchants lived in the town. The town lay surrounded by smaller settlements and individual homesteads, and in the barrows related to these, Scandinavian objects have likewise been found. Surviving genetic findings are few, but do again prove a Scandinavian presence. But not so much Swedish as Danish, and especially Norwegian. More attention could have been devoted to discussing these locations, which are very rich in findings, but this is better delegated to separate videos about the settlements. As a conclusion of these findings, Archaeology points to Scandinavians having traded extensively with the Rus, and settled down in the urban communities as influential warriors, craftsmen, and merchants. They appear both to have taken local wives and brought their own women with them. However, there doesn't seem to have been any mass colonization, nor any founding of new cities. The Scandinavians simply moved into already existing settlements. Due to their low numbers, they appear to have assimilated by the dawn of the 11th century, which corresponds with written evidence the Norse language losing relevance, and mentions of mixed, slavic Varangian individuals. Judging by the pompous burials with their rich findings, evidence can already be found of Scandinavians having been wealthy and most likely influential within Eastern Europe. Thus, it comes as no surprise that this can be corroborated in written sources. For example, the Annales Bertianini, where a group of Swedes calling themselves Rus 
were described as envoys of the Rus Kagan. The primary chronicle preserved two peace treaties between Rus and Byzantium, from 911 to 941 respectively. The treaties contained the names of the Rus diplomats, which signed a treaty, and in both, Scandinavian names are dominant. Interestingly in the treaty, it is said that the Rus swore to uphold it on their gods, Perun and Volos. Both of these are Slavic gods. If the Scandinavians were so influential, why wouldn't they swear on their own gods, Odin and Thor? It can be interpreted in several ways. 1. The diplomats with Scandinavian names were actually Slavs, or they were Scandinavian, but their prince, Oleg, was Slavic, so they had to swear by his gods, not their own. Or maybe the chronicler who recited the treaty 200 years after it was written may not have known of the Norse gods and used the more well-known Slavic deities, or he found it confusing to use the names of those obscure deities compared to the famous Slavic ones especially since they don't appear too dissimilar, especially for a Christian monk in the 11th century. It must also be mentioned that pagan deities were fluid, and their worship often imported and adapted by different cultures. Odin was worshipped by the Slavic Wends, for example, along with their domestic pantheon. If the diplomats were Scandinavian, maybe they respected the native gods of the Slavic heartland, which they operated out of. Traces of Scandinavian culthood can be found in Eastern Europe. Findings from Ryurikava have runic inscriptions carved into them. There are other findings from Staraya Ladega, Gnostava and Kiev, which have Nordic symbols like the Force Hammer and Valkyries, indicating that the Scandinavians brought their beliefs with them. If Scandinavians were influential in the Rus state, then traces should be found in the legal system, literary tradition and language. Regarding language, the Slavonic tongue appears to have been dominant in Rus. Evidence of written Slavonic text even predates the introduction of Christianity. Meanwhile, findings of runic inscriptions are scarce. The treaties between Byzantium and the Rus were written in Greek and Slavonic. Of course, it must be mentioned that both runes and Old Slavonic were primarily written on perishable materials like birch bark, so most findings have vanished over time. But the ones that remain from the period and have been found contain only Slavonic text. It is debated on how many Norse loanwords existed in the Slavonic language. Some estimations range up to a hundred, others as low as a mere six. One of the most prominent is the word for gentleman, gospodin, originating from the Norse husbundi, meaning master of the house. A few names believed to be of Norse origin include but are not limited to Ole from Helgi, Ola from Helga and Ihor from Ingvar. Greek and Arabic appears to have been more influential, which uh, shouldn't be surprising considering Kiev's close connection to Byzantium and the East. Old Slavonic terms pertaining to navigation were often Greek, and those concerning trade, Oriental or Slavic, not Scandinavian. Written literature in Kiev preceded written literature in Scandinavia, and it shows a bigger Byzantine and Bulgarian influence, which again, shouldn't be surprising. Influences from Byzantium can also be found in Scandinavian literature, interestingly, but I digress. Attempts were made to trace Rus poetry to the skaldic tradition, and while there may have been an influence, it seems far-fetched and unlikely, and some have even flat-out denied it. In the same manner, there doesn't seem to be a strong connection in the legal system. Jaroslav's Pravda, the oldest codified law from Rus, does appear similar to Nordic legislation. It gives an offending party the right to avenge themselves upon the offender in case of a murder, abuse or theft. Otherwise, the offender was supposed to pay a fine of 40 grivna. This is an amount of silver, equivalent to about 200 grams. A similar law can be found in Swedish documents from the period, which sets the same fine at 40 mark. Even if there had been a Scandinavian influence in the culture of Rus, it must have been almost entirely supplanted by Greek influence in the 11th century, which shouldn't come as a surprise, considering that Kiev had closer ties to Constantinople than Scandinavia. In conclusion, the origin of the name Rus and the state itself is uncertain, in spite of the many theories, which remain just that. However, in the 9th and early 10th centuries, it appears to have denoted a powerful caste of multi-ethnic traders and warriors. As proven by written evidence, archaeology and genetic studies, Scandinavians were present in the region and participated in trade, military matters and politics. They were merchants, mercenary warriors, and diplomats. Some of them settled down in the region, but only in limited numbers, and rarely outside of already established settlements, 
they do not seem to have founded any new cities. Their exact involvement in the Rus state remains obscure, but it appears as if they had some influence. In regards to culture and language, Scandinavian influence was overshadowed by the more opulent cultures, in Casaria and Byzantium. There remains a lot to be said on the Rus and Viking contact along the Östervägur. I've uploaded two videos discussing the trade routes to Persia and Byzantium, and one about the Varangian Guard. In the future I intend to cover the possible history of the first Rus state, during the 9th century and before, the Kievan Rus going into the Middle Ages, and the prominent trading settlements of Eastern Europe. This video was primarily meant as an introduction to this complicated and often controversial topic, and I hope you enjoyed it, and will look forward to more episodes on this fascinating slice of history. All of the sources to the script can be found in the description box below.